Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I am taking some advice from Kent Hovind. You see, he found my Evidence for Evolution series when I started it, and he popped in to leave a comment. He said, You're 145 years behind on your research, son! <coughs> Watch my creation seminar part <coughs> 4 from drdino.com <coughs> for the truth about embryology, <coughs> or call 855 Big Dino <coughs> Extension 2 to schedule a debate on my channel, Kent Hovind Official, if you want to defend the <coughs> nonsense that you are teaching here. Thinky face, winky face, smiley face. Well, on that video, my oldest source was from the year 2000. I'm curious how I could be 145 years behind on the science when my sources ranged from less than one year old to a maximum of 20 years old, so I decided to check out the seminar that he recommended to me. Now obviously I'm not going to go through the whole thing, it's over two hours long and there is a lot of filler with Kent just making bad jokes and listing things that are the same kind and have offspring of the same kind. You know, his usual shtick. But I'll see if I can pull anything relevant out of this steaming mess. It's a fact Grand Canyon exists. I've been there a bunch of times, studied, I taught her science for 15 years, I love studying Grand Canyon. There are two interpretations of how it got there. The evolutionists will say it formed slowly with a little bit of water and lots of time, like, you know, billions of years. The creationists will say no, it formed quickly by lots of water and a little bit of time, like a big flood in the days of Noah. Well, it is a fact that the creationist interpretation is wrong here. It is a fact that if a massive torrent of water were cutting through soft mud-like material, it would not have resulted in the lazy meandering river like the Colorado. There are several places where it just completely switches directions and doubles back on itself. That would not happen in a massive torrent of water carving through mud. It is a fact that the rock layers that form the canyon would not look anything like they do if they were all formed in one event. In fact, it is also a fact that the rock layers were not formed in one event. And we know this not only through directly radiometrically dating the igneous and metamorphic layers, but through relative dating using what we know about how the various types of layers form and how long they take to form. For instance, there are several layers of limestone that are organic limestone. That is, limestone that is made of sediment resulting from the dead remains of marine organisms. Now I can hear your objection already that of course marine animals died in the Great Flood, that's where their dead remains came from. Except of course the sheer number of organisms whose remains would have had to have been incorporated into the limestone would not have been able to all exist at the same time, it would be physically impossible, the ocean would have been entirely clogged. And of course they all had to exist at the same time as all the coccolithophores whose remains ended up forming the massive chalk beds throughout the world. And somehow the coccolithophores would have had to have remained physically isolated from the rest of the marine creatures whose remains made up the limestone. But there are so many of each that it would not have been possible for them to have existed all at the same time, even if they got to spread out over the whole ocean, and even if the whole ocean got to spread out over the whole world. And that is just one of the many types of rocks in the Grand Canyon's layers that would have needed a lot longer than the one year of the flood in order to form. And the guys who believe in evolution are always trying to erase the line between their interpretation and try to include it as if it is part of the fact. No, no, it's just your interpretation, guys, okay? If we just look at the canyon as a whole and don't take a closer look at any of the details of the canyon, then yes, it is just an interpretation of the fact that the canyon exists. But then, even at this bird's eye view, we can see that the creationist interpretation can't be accurate because of how curvy the river is. But yeah, you do have to ignore the massive mountains of evidence that point to the canyon having been formed over millions of years in order to promote your creationist idea. Lyle is the primary guy responsible for inventing what today is known as the geologic column. I think it's time I gave this a clarification. You see, in a surprise to nobody, Kent is using the wrong terminology here. And I will admit that I have been guilty of this same mistake in this instance, because geologic column is a term that you are not likely to hear a geologist use. And that's because, as I'm sure Kent is about to point out, there's really no such thing as a geologic column. There is the geologic time scale, which can be represented in a chart like the one he's showing, and there are stratigraphic columns, which occur locally and whose layers are matched up to time periods in the geologic time scale. 
A stratigraphic column is a column of strata in a specific location. You can then take several independent stratigraphic columns and coordinate them with each other to create an overall timeline. And there is quite a bit of overlap, as you might imagine, which can be used for cross-referencing and error correction. It's similar to the method that I mentioned in my ice core video of coordinating data between different ice cores and marine sediment cores where they can look for specific markers of widespread events, like volcanic eruptions or asteroid impacts and stuff like that. So this is where the people like Kent swoop in and say, they're lying, there's no such thing as a geologic column, in which he is referring to the one singular location that contains all of the strata going from now all the way back until the formation of the Earth. And that is technically correct. There is no one singular location that is that detailed. But we do have several stratigraphic columns that have been coordinated with high degrees of certainty to give us a very detailed picture of the geologic history of the Earth. Each layer of rock was given a name and an age and an index fossil. Now keep in mind, all this was done in 1830 before there ever was a carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208, Lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238, none of those had even been thought of. Okay, couple things here. First, until the early 1900s, the ages of the various segments of the geologic timescale were very heavily debated. They didn't just assign them ages and then assume that these assignments were correct. Secondly, they didn't just assign them index fossils. Index fossils have to meet very specific criteria in order to be used as such. They must be easy to identify, have a wide geographic distribution, and a short temporal distribution. Now, I know Kent is about to use the they use the fossils to date the rocks and the rocks to date the fossils line, but there is so much more to it than that. Index fossils are more of an indicator of the potential age range for the rock that is being studied. So if a geologist is in the field and they come across a fossil of a Paradoxidae's trilobite, they know that they are looking at rock that originated in the Cambrian, because that is a species that is only found in the Cambrian. Closer analysis of the rock will provide further data and will narrow down the date range, but the discovery of an index fossil is a useful starting point when classifying rocks or for dating sedimentary rocks that are out of the context of their local stratigraphic column. So they didn't determine these great ages by any radiometric metric decay method. Yeah, they did, just not initially. And there was much argument among geologists as to the correct ages for the various layers until radiometric dating came along and all but settled the question once and for all. They just picked the numbers out of the clear blue sky. No, before radiometric dating, they calculated the ages based on relative dating methods that are still used, though more precisely, today. It's a fact the Earth has many layers of sedimentary rock. That is just a fact. You can see them all over Tennessee here. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. One group says, the layers form slowly over millions of years. The other group says, no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. Yeah, the layers formed over the course of one single year, because that doesn't have any problems with it, like entirely different and independent ecosystems existing right on top of each other in the different strata. And again, they're always trying to erase that line between the two and make their interpretation become part of the fact, and it's just not, okay? It really is, though. Scientists didn't go in assuming millions or billions of years. That was a conclusion that happened because of a study of the evidence. In fact, in James Hutton's time, it was the general scientific consensus that the Earth probably was about six to 10,000 years old. But as geologists continued to study the rock layers and learned more about them, the age of the Earth had to increase to make room for the processes that they were observing. It's just their interpretation, that's all. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. The only place you'll ever find it is in the textbooks. Yeah, there it is. Kent complaining that the geologic column doesn't exist. And he's right, but not for the reasons that he's pretending he's right. And I would suggest that, yes, if a textbook is talking about the geologic column, it should be replaced with one that explains the difference between a stratigraphic column and the geologic timescale. But in my experience with Kent, he's rather fond of singling out textbooks that are from high school and earlier, so textbooks that are often written or compiled by people who are not necessarily experts in all of the subjects being taught in the textbook. Which, for the most part, is fine, because high school textbooks generally don't need to get specific enough to get into expert-level knowledge, but then little misconceptions like this can slip through on occasion. It doesn't exist. This guy admits it. He said, if there were a column of sediments, uh, unfortunately, no such column exists. 
Okay, wait, wait a minute, Ken. Didn't you just finish saying that the textbooks are the only place you'll ever find the geologic column? And then to support this, you immediately quote a textbook saying that no such column exists? Why would you not just quote a textbook that presents the geologic column as if it does exist? It's your seminar. You control it. You could have done that. Unless you're mischaracterizing the textbooks, and they don't actually make such mistakes. This entire video is called Lies in the Textbooks, and you can't even show the lie in this case, which kind of makes it look like you are lying about the contents of the textbook. It's based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. Here's a textbook that tells the kids to date the rocks by the fossils, and on the very next page it says date the fossils by the rocks. Oh, called it. You're so predictable, Kent. Now, I'm not about to try and hunt down this specific textbook, but how much do you want to bet that this is in the middle of a section on different dating methods, where it goes into more methods than just using the fossils or the rocks to date each other? Also, I am skipping a bunch here, but just one thing I do want to highlight. If you'll recall from the beginning of this video, Kent was telling me that I was 145 years outdated on my video where my oldest source was 20 years old. Kent, in this video, had a slide quoting Encyclopedia Britannica's 1949 edition, and while I don't know exactly when this was recorded, it was probably in 2006, as he does mention the 2005 soft tissue discovery, but I'm also pretty sure that this was before he went to prison in January of 2007 for 58 counts of failure to pay taxes, structuring, and obstruction. So his oldest source that I've noticed so far is 57 years out of date. Now, I'm not keeping a close eye on these, but I'll let you know if I see older ones. Not that an old source can't still be relevant, but it is one of the tropes of creationism that they take old statements made on subjects that were poorly understood at the time of the statement, but well understood now, and then present those old statements as if they represent the current scientific opinion on the matter. I like to ask evolutionists, I say, guys, your geologic column contains limestone in quite a few places. If I handed you a piece of limestone, how would you know if it's 100 million year old Jurassic limestone or 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? I mean, exactly, what's the difference? And this is another spot where index fossils could come in handy. If the limestone had a trilobite in it, I could tell you confidently that it is Cambrian limestone. But this is where relative dating methods come in. Limestone by itself is hard to get an accurate date for unless it contains an index fossil. Limestone in the context of the stratigraphic column it was taken from can be dated much more precisely based on its location relative to layers that can be dated using absolute dating methods. In other words, context is important. But I wouldn't expect Kent to recognize that fact, since a huge chunk of his seminar is made up of quotes that, when viewed in their proper context, do not say anything close to what Kent is presenting. They'd say, well, the only way to tell the difference is by the index fossils. Uh, that's precisely my point. That is the only way if it had been removed from the context of a stratigraphic location. Well, I mean, it's still not the only way, but it would be the best way. You could start radiometrically dating zircons and get a pretty good estimate that way, but an index fossil would be the best and easiest method in that case. But if it still is in the context of its stratigraphic column, then it becomes much easier to use relative dating methods combined with absolute dating of layers that can be absolutely dated to narrow down the age. They date the layers by the fossils. This textbook shows the kids a trilobite, and it says, boys and girls, trilobites make good index fossils. If a trilobite is found in a rock layer, the rock layer probably formed 500 to 600 million years ago. I don't think so. Somebody found a human shoe print where the guy with a shoe on had stepped on and smashed a trilobite. Yes, this trilobite was found. And you can see on Kent's slide that he claims that it was verified as not being fake by the Utah Geological Survey. And, as with most things that Kent presents, this is not strictly speaking false, but it's not entirely true either. It was examined and determined that the trial bite is in fact genuine, but nobody has examined it and determined that the footprint is genuine. Rather the opposite in fact, every expert that has looked at it has come back with the opinion that it is a type of fracture in the rock known as a spall, and it just happens to have a generally foot-like shape. But if that's an actual footprint, then the old man in the mountain really was an old man. Most evolutionists will say, well, macroevolution is just micro with longer periods of time. No, it's not. They had a big conference on this very question in Chicago. They said the central question of the Chicago conference was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution can be extrapolated to explain the phenomena of macroevolution. The answer can be given as a clear no. 
And in a surprise to no one, I have found that this quote is taken out of context. The conference that this article was summarizing was mainly a debate about whether punctuated equilibrium or gradualism is more accurate, a debate which is still happening today with no clear winner. Both sides make good points. Now, just to summarize, the gradualists argue that evolution occurs at a relatively constant rate, with changes accumulating ever so slowly, while the punctuated equilibrium proponents argue that organisms remain morphologically the same for sometimes millions of years, and then something changes which drives rapid evolution in a short period of time. Now, I know that my opinion carries zero weight in the matter, but personally, I think we will eventually figure out that it is a combination of the two. There are, for long periods of time, gradual changes to the genetic code, with no obvious morphological changes, and then eventually these changes will trigger some larger, morphologically obvious change that won't necessarily have any predecessors apparent in the fossil record. And I think this is supported by what we see happening in species today. For instance, we know that humans in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa Africa developed the ability to digest lactose into adulthood about 10,000 years ago. This genetic change would not leave any apparent morphological difference in the fossil record, but it is definitely a type of evolution that even Kent could accept. It is microevolution, a genetic change within a species. And we also know that large-scale changes can often be sudden, but can also be contingent on smaller, less obvious changes that happened in the past. So back to the quote, the author was essentially saying that he found the argument for punctuated equilibrium to be the more convincing of the two. They always end up producing the same kind of offspring, just like the Bible says. The information for the new variety had to be in the gene code already, or it couldn't produce it. No new information is ever added. No new information, eh? Well, here's a 2003 paper describing where new genes come from. Here's one from 2002 explaining what happens to genes after they have been duplicated. Here's another one from 2002 describing several evolutionarily recent duplication events that have been detected in the human genome. Remember this graphic from my Evidence for Evolution sequence homology video? No, you probably don't because only about a third of you watch those videos to begin with, so let's go over this again briefly. This is a map of the human genome. The blue lines indicate duplications that have happened within a chromosome. The red bars are areas that are duplicated across chromosomes. Purple bars are areas that weren't examined. And the gold bars are areas that are themselves unique, but are bracketed by interchromosomal duplications on either side, which is an important marker for studying genetic disease. So I guess add that to the list of practical uses of the study of evolution. Our studying of how genetic material evolves has helped us identify areas that are associated with genetic disorders. This paper from 2000 discusses what happens to genes after they have duplicated, and explains how gene duplication plays an important role in speciation, or macroevolution. Here's one from 1999 that explains how duplicated genes persist in the genome long enough to allow them to acquire new functions. I could do this all day, and each of these papers has dozens of citations to support their positions. And to top it all off, I limited the research I presented here to papers published before 2005. In other words, this is all stuff that Kent could have found if he had spent just a few minutes actually researching the subject before this presentation. But no, new genetic information showing up in the genome is completely impossible. You know, broccoli, ca cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts all have a common ancestor called a plant. Holy fuck, Kent, you are so close with that one. But like, really? All plants are the same kind to you now? Does that mean you would accept that grass and oak trees are related? And yeah, all those plants are related. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, kohlrabi, cauliflower, and cabbage are all descended, as you showed in your own slide, from a mustard plant. Now, Kent, I know you're a fan of getting children to do your thinking for you, so let's get a second opinion here from my seven-year-old son. Okay, so I have with me my littlest rhino. Can you say hi? Hi. Okay, so now look at this plant over here. You see the plant? Yeah. Now, do you see that plant? Yeah. Are they the same kind of plant? No. No? Okay, good job, buddy. High five. So there you have it, using Kent's foolproof test for determining whether or not something is the same kind, we have determined that the wild mustard plant is not the same kind as the Brussels sprout plant. And since we know that Brussels sprouts were developed from wild mustard, we now know that macroevolution is a fact, since wild mustard eventually produced something of a different kind. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they say mutations make something new. That's never been observed. Check my description. I have several scientific sources that disagree with you on that point.
Number two, natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Evolution is actually a religion of death. In order for evolution to work, one animal evolves a little better than the rest. What must happen to the rest of them to make this thing work? They gotta die. Nope. The one that is working better must just have better reproductive success. Now, sometimes, yes, this does mean that the ones without the beneficial mutation will die at a higher rate, but it's not like a new mutation develops and then within a generation all of the non-mutated members of the population have to die off. No, it can take thousands of years for a beneficial mutation to work its way through the population. Earlier I brought up our ability to digest lactose into adulthood. That is a beneficial mutation. It provided a new source of calorie and nutrient-dense nourishment. Did the rest of humanity die off because these groups developed a beneficial mutation? No. In fact, there is still a good chunk of the world's population that is lactose intolerant today. And this mutation happened about 10,000 years ago. It's had 10,000 years, all of recorded human history, to permeate the population, and it hasn't gotten there yet. It probably will eventually, but that doesn't require everyone else to die off. Mutations permeate a population through mating. So if a mutation helps an organism have more offspring, and those offspring carry the mutation, then that mutation will gradually make its way through the population. You know why they didn't show a picture of a good mutation? Because nobody's ever seen one. The ability to digest lactose into adulthood. ApoA1 melano, a mutation that slightly changed the structure of the apolipoprotein A1 in a way that helps prevent heart disease. And this mutation is being studied to come up with potential treatments for heart disease. Then there's the family with unusually high bone density, a mutation which is being studied for potential treatments for osteoporosis. The E. coli that developed the ability to metabolize citrate. The mosquitoes that adapted to life in the London Underground. To say that a beneficial mutation has never been observed is a flat-out lie. And that also ignores the fact that a mutation in and of itself is usually neither beneficial nor detrimental. What determines whether a mutation is beneficial or not is the environment in which the organism lives. After all, E. coli that is able to metabolize citrate would not necessarily have an advantage over regular E. coli if there were no citrate available to use as a food source. This textbook says the similarity between early stages of development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this the strongest class of facts in favor of his theory. This was the best evidence Darwin knew of for his theory. The guy who made up this dumb idea is named Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel called this idea we're about to share with you the biogenetic law. Ah uh, yes, Haeckel's biogenetic law. I know where you're going with this. This was Haeckel's take on recapitulation theory, which was the idea that all embryos go through stages that are the same as the adult forms of all of its evolutionary ancestors. And he was wrong. And we know he was wrong. And your suggestion here that Darwin was right on board with this idea is a flat-out lie. Darwin completely disagreed with Haeckel on this point. Darwin argued that embryos diverge more from one another as development progressed. In other words, Darwin was suggesting that the embryos started off being morphologically similar to each other and then gradually grew to be more similar to their eventual adult form, while Haeckel was arguing that each stage of the embryo was an adult form of one of the organism's evolutionary ancestors. Darwin's theory, his book came out 1859, he predicted they would find evidence. 1869, Haeckel faked the drawings. 1875, it was proven wrong. Okay, this went exactly where I thought it was going. Now, I haven't watched through the whole seminar, but in the eight or so minutes here where Kent talks about embryology, this is it. He just says that Haeckel faked his embryo drawings, which is partially true, and then states that Haeckel was convicted of fraud for this fakery, which I have thus far been unable to verify, as the only information on the subject is secondhand quotes on creationist websites, but it doesn't matter, because Hovind is lying here. Haeckel being proved wrong had nothing to do with the gill slits. It was all about the idea that each embryonic stage is a representation of an adult form of an evolutionary ancestor that was wrong, and Haeckel fudged his drawings a bit to make it look more like his idea was correct. His drawings were still fairly accurate, and we have since photographically confirmed that the similarities they talk about in the textbooks are actually there. Now, in a twist ending here, I actually agree with Hovind. I think that the Haeckel drawings should be removed from textbooks and replaced with actual pictures, which, come to think of it, in several of the examples that Hovind went through, it's already happened. That way, maybe the creationists will stop bringing up Haeckel's drawings of some kind of gotcha, because they're really not. All right, I'm done with this one now. I'm not even halfway through, and Hovind has yet to present anything that I haven't heard a bunch of times before. 
So it turns out that I'm 145 years out of date because Haeckel was found to be wrong about 145 years ago, which might indeed make me out of date if I were presenting Haeckel's ideas. But I was not, nor have I ever been. If you want a more in-depth look at his seminar series, I recommend Logic's Hello, My Name is Kent Hovind series. It is classic logic at his best. He goes through the older version of the seminar, but Kent has never changed his script as far as I can tell, so it's literally the exact same thing. Today's comment of the day is from Zarai, who says, God damn it, Rhino, this is a three-year-old video, what the fuck? To which I replied that every time someone complains about how old the video that I'm responding to is, I will pick an even older video to do next. So how'd you like this one, Zarai? Joking aside, though, sometimes it can be hard to find actual new material to respond to. There are only so many creationist organizations, and they only put out so much content, and oftentimes it's in the format of an hour-plus-long sermon that I'd have to wade through to get to five minutes of content to respond to. So sometimes the old stuff is the stuff that fits into my video style better, and it's not like creationists are getting any new arguments anyway. I'm still waiting for them to bring up the new Mary Schweitzer discovery of DNA and dinosaur bones. The consensus opinion is still out on her soft tissue discovery, and this one small study doesn't definitively prove anything, but that's never stopped creationists before. Actually, if she really did find traces of dinosaur DNA, that would be super exciting. It would be the first step toward merging molecular biology with paleontology. But at the moment, she is still facing heavy criticism, and rightly so. That's how science works. You find something amazing that goes against the consensus, and your one-off study, no matter how robust, will not be enough to sway the consensus. It needs to be replicated. Thanks for watching. Special thanks, as always, to my patrons, especially Mark McManus. My patrons are the catnip that keeps the cat that is my channel flying high. If you'd like to be my psychoactive drug, consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, including direct donation and my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and P.O. Box address. See you next time! Index fossils are more of an in index fossils are more of an in an in 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 index fossils are more of an in an in in an in in an in in an in in index fossils are more of an indication indication in an indication an indicator not indication I'm going to say that wrong again ah to double index fossils are more of an in <laughs> My tongue gets stuck on the end. <laughs> Index fossils are more of an indicator of the potential age range for the rock that is being studied. Yes, got it.